Thank you all so much for joining our first Nutrition Talks of 2024 with Omega Quant. My name is Tavis Piatol. Piatoli, I can't even say my last name, health account educator, dietitian, uh, work with our sales team and department at Omega Quant. We'll talk a little bit about more about um, the brand a little bit later. Before we get with Dr. Annette Bosworth, we're doing something a little bit different this time. In the past, in 2023, we just did strictly educational webinars. This year, we wanted to do something different to kick off 2024 and really talk about bringing in a practitioner that has used Omega Quant in her practice and has helped kind of scale her business. And we'll talk about the, uh, the actual success she's had in a few minutes. And then we're going to be talking about a few different things we're going to be doing in 2024 regarding our webinar series. Before we get started, I do want to share my screen. I just want to kind of share a few things about what's coming. Um, so let me just share that slide deck. Just a, a few important notes. The recording of today's session will be sent to all registered by the end of the week or early next week. So if you did register for this um, or if you're not here, which you're probably not if you're not seeing this, then we will get you a copy of this. If you miss something, if you have to leave early, uh, that will be available for you as well. If you have a question for Dr. Boss, please put that in the chat section. So that's important to where we are going to moderate that. Uh, put that in the chat. We'll be able to go back and look at that and get as many questions as we possibly can get answered. Also, be on the lookout very soon. Our next Nutrition Talks webinar will be Omega-3s and AFib. What's the real story? With our founder, Dr. Bill Harris, he's the founder of Omega Quant. That'll be Tuesday, February the 20th at 12 p.m. Central Time. So be on the lookout for that. That's going to be something where he's going to answer a lot of questions and concerns that people have had about this. We get a lot of questions about, hey, what are the concerns about Omega-3 and AFib? And Dr. Bill will talk a lot about that. All right. So let's dive into today's topic. Let me stop sharing my screen. And then let me introduce you to a Dr. Annette Bosworth. She is an internal medicine physician. She educates the audience on how to optimize their brain health. Her first book, Any Way You Can, told the story of what happened when her 71-year-old mother dying of cancer asked, Doc, what would you do? Grandma Rose's story of courage, faith, and tenacity sold over 100,000 copies and inspired many to improve their health through ketogenic nutrition. Her second book, Keto Continuum, uses David's story to teach the protocol she uses to help patients stay consistently keto. Dr. Boz has been an assistant professor. She's been featured on CNN, Time Magazine, US News and World Report, Fox News and more. She also teaches you how to overcome long-term chronic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, depression, autoimmune problems, addiction, and more. Dr. Boz, thank you so much for joining us today in this live webinar format. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, uh, not jealous of your uh, winter storm that's hitting Sioux Falls, South Dakota and uh, freezing you to the ground. Are you out of Sioux Falls uh, where you're? I am. I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm actually way down south, right outside New Orleans, so I don't have to deal with all the oh. snow. But this morning it was 18 degrees with ice and sleet. So my daughter's school is closed. And for us, that's like that's for, that's crazy cold. That's like the the humidity for some people that we have down here up north. <laughs> well, fifty years in South Dakota, I have a, a default of just checking the the roads. And in Florida, in Tampa, well, the only thing you need to check the roads for is traffic. Never black ice or this you know freezing mess they have there. But my phone still tells me when. Well, when I'm thankful that I live in ta Tampa, <laughs> and that is when these winter <laughs> conditions are doing what they're doing to the good folks at Omega Quant. Excellent. Well, as we dive into today's topic, I know we're going to learn a lot, but before we really get into the nuts and bolts of this, let's learn a little about your career path and current medical practice. What type of patients do you see in your practice? Tell us a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, internal medicine is what my uh, title above on the diploma is, and I've thought it's a perfect fit for my personality where I, I don't uh, really feel satisfied with a superficial understanding. I really like to dive deep and that's served me well over the years as I thought about different areas in medicine, but really landed with uh, outpatient internal medicine and a, a strong emphasis on peak brain performance. Um, my first uh, season in healthcare was um, you know, as in outpatient practice linked me to a bunch of Parkinson's research and how do we improve that, you know, chronically deteriorating brain problem. And I really think that set the foundation for always wondering how would that connect with, you know, the patients that didn't have Parkinson's yet, that did have 
several signals that this was not going to be a good journey if we didn't fix a few things. But um, so as I look over the years of how it has morphed, uh, the, the tapestry of a thread all the way through the patients is they all had brains. <laughs> they all said, boy, I don't want to lose that. And um, how do you, how do you, you know, really fold that into the other treatment plans where they're, you know, the reason they're coming is their thyroid refill or their, you know, diabetes uh, risks or high blood pressure. Uh, but then knowing that when you put on the layer of, we can get that blood pressure to look normal, but how do you have the best brain as you go forward? I, you know, I, and I, I've just been really thankful for what that exposure to, you know, the, the research and the severe consequences of an advanced um, Parkinson's dis disease looks like, because it, it, it really did set the tone for me to be able to say, yeah, we can do okay, but we should do great, and here's why. And I think that's probably the foundation of all of my um, uh, years accumulated into one is, yep, bread and butter internal medicine is what I do, but my passion really comes out with how do you get the best brain before, right up till the day before you head to the other side. Yeah, no, that's it's interesting how you specialize in, in that specific area because there's a lot of research in a lot of different areas. But obviously what we do in nutrients, omega-3 plays a pretty big role. And I know we're not going to dive into just that today. But really, one of the things we want to learn about, because I know a lot of practitioners like to dive into social media, right? It's it's one of those things where people are like, how do I how do I build a YouTube account? How do I get followers? How do I do this? And you've been incredibly successful when it comes to growing that. You have a big social media following. What strategies did you implement to help you grow your followers and what kind of content do you create to help that? Well, I'll tell you, um, when I was hearing the bio, I, I, I should have looked at the update because I, uh, how I became good at social media was I stayed married. I lost a bet to my husband. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I think I think storytelling has been something that I didn't want to admit is a big part of who I am. Uh, whether you're talking to a patient to try and get them to see the parallels of what their choices are going to lead towards, or even, you know, how to, how to teach kids, how to get your kids to do things. The storytelling, whether it's, uh, I don't know, part of being a prairie woman from South Dakota, or if it's just something that God gifted me with, that as I was collecting stories in my career and using them as ways to teach and to help students really engage in the in information, the story of my mom was, um, well, it was, you know, very intimate, very emotional and, and changed so many lives because I wrote that book. But I didn't want to write the book. I was keeping sticky notes of what we were doing and they were around the house, particularly in our bathroom. And my husband, we'd been at this point married for, I don't know, 23 years or something. And he kept saying, you should write a book. You should write a book. <laughs> and if you've been married for 23 years, you'll know that the first thing I'm not gonna do is what my husband tells me to do. <laughs> so um, one day the, the, there was a, a bet that has happened multiple times in our relationship, but this one I was sure I was right. And he goes, if I'm right, you got to take the next four months and write the, write a book. Write that write that story down. Um, if you're right, I'll stop asking. By gosh, I was wrong. So I lost a bet, and I honored the bet, and I wrote the book down. And I was just so ready to be done. I I thought for sure, okay, this is enough. But what was hidden in that book were the several of the places that, well, I was I was teaching uh, patients through her story, through other people's stories. And when I got done writing the book, um, he said, you should just take each of the chapters of that book and put it on YouTube. I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, I had used YouTube previously to solve a problem. Uh, I think the first thing I ever launched in on YouTube was in 2012. And I was really irritated that I was running my own clinic and you know taking care of brains, uh, but other things. And how critical uh, a, a patient's outcome was, was specifically linked to how well they were sleeping. And so they would come in and they have this 20 or 40 minute appointment and they have all of these things they want me to take care of and I can't get anywhere. I can give you a bunch of medicines, but I couldn't get anywhere unless 
I fixed your sleep unless you you paid attention to sleep. And unfortunately, their brains just didn't work well enough to fix the sleep in five minutes or less. You really needed to listen to me. So finally, I said, all right, I am not going to see you again until you have watched this YouTube video and you've filled in these little blanks because I don't ha I don't get paid to teach you, but I can't do my job unless you learn this and your brain is broken. You can't remember what I said from one minute, one visit to the next. I want to help you, but my help is going to look terrible when we measure outcomes if you don't do these other steps. So you can call it a default patient coordinator educator, but that was my first video on YouTube. And I can remember the day it hit a million views. Hmm. And I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, look how many things. So if patients would come in, I was sending them to my YouTube channel to say, if you haven't filled out this piece of paper with these blanks in it, then I know you didn't watch that video and I will make you sit in my front room, you know, waiting room and watch that video before I'll see you again, because I can't help you without you knowing these things. And I can't, I can't possibly say it again. I'm gonna lose my mind. So in that same aspects, I had a few, a uh, few things on YouTube, but it became, uh, I mean, I think one of the things YouTube really does communicate without saying it is what's your motive and when the motive behind a YouTube channel is you know product sales or um, you know flashy clickbait they might do well for a while but to steadily grow an audience uh, in the way that I have um, that first sleep video really set the tone for what I'm really trying to do is uh, be that be a teacher uh, so that when you do get in front of me, I can pick up at an advanced conversation instead of a kindergarten conversation when it comes to improving your health. So I, I think anybody who is looking for social media, if you want attraction, uh, the beautiful part of practitioners is you already have an audience of people that trust you. Um, that if the videos you put out or if you're trying to do this from the beginning, I would just give the highest recommendation that you start with this genuine voice of, what is it that you're sick and tired of telling patients over and over and over and over again and put it on a video and send your patients to watch it? It is brilliant, first of all. It's like the fastest way to get frustration out of my life was, okay, at least we covered sleep. And of course, we took off from there to, you know, teaching other things. And, and I had this little bitty YouTube channel, like, you know, 10,000 subscribers or something. And it was just enough for me to say, okay, okay, that's fine. And then I did that thing with my chapters of the book. And I, I compare this to being pregnant with my first child. And I kept telling my husband, hey, husband, I think the baby's moving. And he would put his hand on him. Oh, it's gas. There's no, but uh, yeah, I think the baby's moving. Hey, I think the baby's moving. He couldn't feel a thing. He didn't notice a thing. So I have this YouTube channel and it's not doing anything. And I did his, you know, I did the videos he was asking for and it was terrible because I didn't know what I was doing, but I didn't care. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try it. And I got um, one day where I went from 10,000 subscribers to over 100,000 subscribers in 48 hours wow. where something went viral. And I kept saying, honey, I think there's something going on with my YouTube channel. Oh, I, I think there's something going on, on my YouTube channel. Uh, we were busy. We were doing something with the kids and I wasn't looking at social media. I was like, whatever. I think there's something going on, on my YouTube videos. And so we get back from wherever we were at and he's like, did you know there's a hundred thousand people that are subscribing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I told you the baby was moving. <laughs> <laughs> just gas. <laughs> yeah, just gas. Yeah. <laughs> no, you said something pretty critical there, right? Building trust. And I think that's important because from 2012, when you started to now, YouTube's a whole different medium and what people are using and the type of people and the misinformation and the quality of information that's being provided because anyone can start a channel and say things. And it's like, wow, do I trust that person? That doesn't sound right. Or it's the background. So it's 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 really incredible how you've grown that uh, and, and, and able to service people with quality education. Now, when did you discover Omega Quant? You, you've used Omega Quant now for a good bit of time in your in your practice. When did you when did you discover the lab, and then also when did you start implementing those testing services in your practice? So I will tell you, this is a super embarrassing story. I don't know if you know this story, but all right. So I am a, I hang my own shingle in a world where it's easier to be a corporate physician. 
And the danger of being the little physician outside the flock is you should be careful if you do things too differently because it's hard to get insurance to approve things it's, if you're the only doc referring to this. So I remember um, thinking this dang cholesterol stuff is just not predicting heart disease as well as it should be. And you would read about how important omega-3 was, uh, you know, measuring omega-3, how do you get to omega-3? And I had read papers about how you can measure the type of fat inside the red blood cells and that was one of the best correlations to how well this omega-3 presence and then, you know, the fluidity of cell membranes and several other things was predicting heart disease way, and brain disease, again, my thing, way better than my total cholesterol, even LDL cholesterol, you know, even C-reactive protein, it was doing better than in a couple of studies. And you're like, gosh, wh how, how do you measure this? And I was, you know, noodling around trying to solve that problem when I heard Dr. Harris on a podcast with, um, oh, the guy from, uh, he's from Australia. He has a wonderful accent. He's like a, not quite a citizen scientist, but he's an engineer that does a great teaching. If anybody in the chat knows who I'm talking about, <laughs> uh, he, he, he's almost like an engineer gone journalist gone, how do you reverse heart disease? And he talks a lot about cal coronary artery calcium scores. And I remember hearing, oh, that's a great idea. And he had mentioned a couple papers and I downloaded the papers and I'm reading about this William Harris and blah, blah, blah. And it was, and I'm like, okay, um, I, how do you order it? And I then look at, I look it up and I think, okay, I could go through LabCorp and Quest and order it, but it seemed like a, you know, a hitch in the giddy up that it was not as easy. So I said, well, let me just reach out to the company with an email saying, is there a different way to do this? And I thought, huh, that address is either a Dropbox or it's, or it's a guy in my own town. I thought it can't be somebody who's living in Sioux Falls, South Dakota that I would know about it. And so then I'm like, okay, it must be a Dropbox. So I, I think I was taking one of the kids to, I don't know, wrestling practice or something. And I'm like, I'm just going to drive by 12th street and see what is that? And I'm like, oh my goodness, this test that I have been noodling around reading several papers about <laughs> has this Harris guy that I just, as I'm pulling up, go, oh, William Harris. Oh, that's Bill Harris. He like sits two seats down for me at the School of Medicine meetings that we've been going to for 10 years. And he is such <laughs> a like humble guy that I'm like, you, you do all this research. You're the guy that I've been chasing. How do I get to do these tests better? <laughs> <laughs> I just tongue lashed him good and proper. You need to brag about yourself more, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. He's definitely a very humble individual, which it's great. It's it's on it's pretty unknown and sometimes in these world of people that have a lot of influence, right? They want to they want that attention. Now, yeah, and I I just have really so then I I got into some pretty good debates with him about things that I had, you know, you get an idea in your mind and I'm like I just need to fight this out with somebody who knows what they're doing that's not on social media. I just need to really have an honest debate with a clinician and boy, it's nothing like Bill Harris saying, here, read 30 pages of 15 different, you know, <laughs> studies uh, before you come in, because this is what we're going to argue about. I'm like, oh, but he did. And that's what we did. And so, so that's how I got to, I mean, I really did come through the back door and was, I don't know, honored that he was part of the medical school that I, you know, was teaching for and that it was in my medical community. And it was about the time he, you know, it was a, like probably a couple of years later that he officially retired and then has done some even better work after that. So honestly, that's how I came about it was trying to solve for how do you better predict brain disease, better predict heart disease. And then when the test was not like the easiest thing to order in LabCorp and um, Quest, I'm like, well, let me just reach out to the company. Yeah, and someone mentioned uh, about the Australian, was it Gerald Quigley? Uh, wasn't that one. Um, okay. Uh, but that I see that name, oh, he's, a, he's got, Oh. And I'm sure someone from our team would know that. Oh, he's great too, and he 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 he's really been uh, a voice to say you're not predicting heart disease very well when you measure LDL cholesterol. 
you know, coronary artery calcium scores is the other thing. I, when, he, when, I, when I come to his name, it will be embarrassing that I can't think of it right now. Uh, but the beauty was, how do you turn into the spin and find an avenue that your patients can actually um, really follow as opposed to what we were doing with heart disease, which I mean, really turned into take my pill. That's what I've got to offer you. Right. Now, when we talk about testing in practice, what you do, what what type of test are you currently using or recommending in your practice? And what are some of the benefits of using those at-home test kits? Yeah, you know, as I have really gone from that brick-and-mortar traditional uh, corporate physician to having my own practice to really finding a niche in a practice, which is still internal medicine, but focuses on how do you reverse chronic problems instead of keep adding them, um, that I, I think that the audience, the character who's attracted to that, that they do not like dictatorships. I don't think anybody does, but I, maybe that these patients are really good about telling me, uh, don't tell me what to do, give me some options and then I'll choose. And I'm like, okay. And then I, I'm a big stickler that if I'm gonna give you options to choose from, we are not going to uh, have something that's not measurable. So we will make a decision and then we're gonna measure something and then we're gonna measure something after you've done a while. And how often I see you can sometimes be related to the measurements or if you can measure it and we can communicate without seeing you, that's fine by me too. And as I looked to serve this audience of people that really just wanted to get off of this, uh, you know, the kind of medications that I was known for prescribing and I still, known, I still prescribe, but um, the kind of test that, that we said predicted chronic disease, um, well, lots of insurance companies didn't cover them. I, if I went through an insurance company for Omega Quant, I mean, even just that one, you couldn't often get it. Uh, even like hemoglobin A1C, I mean, there are some places that will cover it as a screening, but they do not like you to screen that way. They want you to screen with a blood sugar. And I'm like, this is the long, you are so far behind the game when you do that. And as if it's normal, I mean, again, their normal and my normal are different, then I would be fighting with what these insurance companies wanted me to do. And so then I'd say, well, you could pay cash. <laughs> and if you've ever seen the game of lab costs to, about cash to people who have insurance. So if insurance doesn't cover it, then the fee that they send to those patients is astronomical. Whereas if I just said, hey, they're homeless and they're paying cash, it was like a 10th, sometimes a 20th of the cost. Yep. And so I'm like, I am not helping this patient by saying here, this hemoglobin A1C shouldn't cost you no more than $100, but because you have insurance, um, it might be 120. And if you tell them you don't have any insurance, they're gonna charge you 20 or $30 or something much, yep. much less. And you know, I, I hated that and so did the patients. So when I, when I first stumbled on to like, oh, I can order a test that even if I don't check your A1C every you know three months or every six months, I want your omega-3 checked every three months. And I want you and I communicating that this is the right thing to do. I mean, that you're headed in the right direction. And when I get your omega-3 to a certain number, now we're gonna check what your A1C is doing. We're gonna spend the money through your insurance companies. And boy, that's been a good plan. Uh, the empowerment of the patient is what I really have been, um, <laughs> You know, they like to see that they're testing their own thing. They're doing, you know, they're checking it and they're, they take ownership of it. And as you might, you might not guess on the first time through when I, when you take care of people who are looking for peak brain performance, it will sometimes, I mean, it's pretty selective for people who've had troubles with their brain. And if you want to see the worst uh, troubles with brains, it comes from a land of folks who've been addicted to something, sex, drugs, rock and roll, carbohydrates, find anything, you know, that addiction not only portrays poor sleep usually, but it also is correlated to some pretty good destruction, whether that's from a, a chemical or, or a metabolism. And so as you would say, these are the kind of things when, when I can get this number higher, not only is that going to, you know, lower your risk of a heart attack, but that brain function is gonna get better too. And so omega-3 was one of those first things where I said, if you're gonna fix one number, this is hard to do, but it is worth doing. And that's that omega-3 is going to do a much better job of reversing some of these injuries inside your brain and finding that peak brain performance again, uh, even if the cause was sex, drugs, rock and roll. 
sounds like we need to get you back at some point just to talk about the brain and, and you know and all the things you do there because it's a it's a fascinating topic and as you mentioned there's a lot of research on the benefits of omega-3 and optimizing those scores now you shared about how you educate your patients which is important because a lot of practitioners struggle with that what has been your feedback from your patients in regards to at-home tests versus blood draw is this something where it's more convenient to do that in the office versus sending them out to a, a blood draw lab? You know, we um, have had, COVID cha sure changed a lot. So keeping a stack of those tests at our office was uh, one way to do it. Um, but we then just said, here, <laughs> order it from Omega Quant and you're gonna be able to net have access to your da dashboard for, you know, going forward and we don't have to be a part of that. Um, but also you, the ownership of somebody choosing to get better, um, when we were still in charge of, you know, we'd have a stack of Omega Crons or their vitamin, whatever we were testing and we would do it in the office. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm impressed with something I didn't expect, but looking back, maybe that was silly not to expect it was, oh, if you give complete ownership to the patient, um, they either choose to move forward or go away. And when that that patient who really just want they want a better health, they want better life, health, quality, that ownership, it empowers them. Like, okay, this is me. I'm checking this. Even if I don't see Dr. Bosworth for a year, I should be checking this three more times in a year so that I have one every three months. And when the trajectory isn't great, then that feedback is something I should be using to change course of what I should be doing. Um, you know, I'll tell you another story about personal testing that I would have never done had it not been for Omega Quant. And it's the, the interval for testing is, you know, standard is three months, right? That's how long the blood cells last. And that's what everybody says to do. But if you watch people's behavior, it's an awfully long time in between testing to keep them focused on the behavior change that they should be working, you know, that they're trying to improve. And so um, I did an experiment on YouTube with uh, when your A1C came out. Again, a test I use all the time and I really hated the fight I had with insurance companies to say, gee, we should check to see how glycated these hemoglobin are in the red blood cells long before they get diabetes. G give me the 10 years ahead of time. And um, <laughs> so I checked mine and it was that after a season of pretty good stress and moving and oh my A1C was higher than I, I mean, I like mine around five, 5.1. And my A1C, I think it was like five, four or five, five. It was, I didn't like it. And I was, you know, sending the test kits out to my staff. And so three or four of us tested it. And we all said, dang, we should have been, we should have been better. Um, oh, I know where we were at, we were at an event. And so I had everybody on the team test their own A1C so they could learn how to test anybody coming through the, uh, the booth. And there were three or four of us that said, okay, okay, this is out of control. I sh it should be less. And so I said, I will pay for your testing to be done every month so that we see the next three months, how our A1C is done. And I got the idea because a patient said, I can't wait three months. I need to know that this is better in a month and the month after that. And of course, mathematically, it should be better. It's just going to be a whole lot better at three months with that change than it is. And my goodness, I can't believe how much that, A, the competition within our office <laughs> really motivated me. I like to win. Uh, <laughs> and then how that, you know, I, I kept thinking, you know, if I have that bite of whatever, my A1C is going to be tested in three weeks. And I, so that shorter time frame in between tests, it was very valuable to me. And I think that was one of the first times where I changed my behavior because I checked my own test. And the teammates that said yes to doing it with me, they also said, boy, I could just feel myself on that live YouTube channel for the follow-up saying, huh, uh, I was the worst one on the team. <laughs> so that social pressure to change uh, was, you know, and I think that's what medicine has really been, I think, a, a significant injustice is, you know, we took HIPAA to mean that you can never tell anybody about your medical problems. And like, no, you are in a community that makes choices. And so much of our health health 
disparities in health decline and quality of life is related to the choices that we're making. And that discussion of, hey, here's my A1C, what's yours? And, and then owning what that means, that never got better. I mean, that got its best when I'm communicating with patients, when they're the ones ordering it, they're the ones following it up. I mean, they are really engaged in the process of how do you make this better? And I know it sounds obvious, but I just didn't really become a believer of that until my team and I did that. And so when I look at, um, you know, how we've morphed from testing even the Omega Quant stuff ourselves, and then really passing that ownership on to the patient, um, you know, I think, I think it, it rewarded the patient and their improvement far greater than I was expecting. You mentioned something pretty critical that we've done some internal research at conferences and looking at practitioners that test themselves. I think they're like 80% more likely to recommend those same tests for their patients because now they know what to say. They know what to do and they know the significance. You mentioned your A1C and why that's important. It's important to share that data with each, with each other for those that are open to open-minded to share that information. Right. And now, I think you, it should, yeah, like you said, that locked behind the exam room door. So then they hold on to this secret, like, oh, it's, it's you know, so maybe they have a couple people to measure against, like, well, my A1C was five, seven. And, you know, I know my great uncle died of diabetes and his was, you know, 12, or 10 or something. And so then they have that one measuring stick where you say, no, 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 I want you comparing to other healthy people. And how do you use that positive peer pressure to change a behavior because you're trying to be like the healthy guy next to you. Well, if you look at, you know, prior to, to you know, point of care tests, what the heck, you couldn't get the insurance to measure the healthy guy. And so now you're stuck with saying the only people you can measure against are the ones that are on their way to the grave and they're on their a, 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 a freight train headed that way, that by the time I finally get the insurance company to agree to test all the things I want to test, it's hard to derail it. Right. You mentioned, you know, you talked just talked about the positive aspects. And one of the things we want to kind of look at is how has testing helped grow your practice and business, you know, with utilizing our test? We'll talk about something else in the next question, but is there anything you'd like to share in regards to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So one of the hardest parts about internal medicine is as you age, your patients do. <laughs> Uh, and you say, well, I was really good at, you know, 30, 40 year olds when I was that age. Now I'm 52. And so I, I suppose I'm going to get better at those ages as I go through them. But what happens when you start attracting a patient who is trying to reverse their health, is trying their health problems, trying to reverse those chronic diseases, is that uh, they, they, they get healthier and their friends now get healthier. And my patient population has gone down in age instead of what traditional internal medicine is to go up in age. And the amount of people who graduate, which sounds like a terrible business model, but they don't need to see me that often. I mean, it really is, uh, well, it's very satisfying as a physician to say, you know, get healthy enough that you don't need me because I'm your ticket to the grave if I keep writing these prescriptions and you keep putting on weight. Uh, the reversal is you taking ownership. And I think when, you know, I'm a very big advocate of support groups. Um, I suppose it comes from the addiction treatments where, you know, and I would, I've always had an electronic medical record, so I could always study my outcomes. And that might sound like a total nerdy thing to do, but I really cared about that. And when I was, when I looked back over about a 10 year period, maybe seven year period, of addiction and said, gosh, there's just some of these patients who they're sober for five, you know, at the five year mark, which is unheard of. They've really course corrected their life. And so I wonder if I could, you know, do a study or pay a social worker to say, call the patient and see what, you know, they think made the difference or let's study their charts. And, you know, I, I would use, you know, these advanced drugs. I would, you know, do TMS to their brain. I would, you know, you know, do all these, you know, test this thing and make them urine tests. And you know, I would do all kinds of things that were a little outside the box to say, how do I, how do I, you know, get the best outcomes? But you know, take a guess, Tavis, what was the number one best predictor of someone who was sober at five years? Wow. 
that's a tough question to answer. The best predictor, brain, I, I don't know. Um, no idea. Uh, attendance at the support group. Really? So just compliance? Yeah. So they would come to the support group, and what they would learn in that group was, I mean, it, it was way more important than the shot I was giving them in their butt. It was way more important than drug testing them. Uh, that behavior, even if they stumbled quite a bit at the beginning, they, those who attended, they saw something in themselves. They changed behavior in a way that, you know, isn't so much, you know, the westernized medicine, but really that, that spiritual, psychological, and community aspect to improving your health, which is when you mess it up, don't fall into the ditch and stay stuck. Come back to group and we'll, we'll give you a hand. We'll help you out of that, that place. And I, I just have learned that even when I'm not talking about sex, drugs, rock and roll, we're talking about how do you give up carbohydrates or how do you get a vitamin D that's you know best for COVID. In community, that does a way better voice than me saying, here, you should do this and you should do this. Uh, so I guess for some of those, it's ha for them seeing others that have had success in that support group that, hey, I could do this. These individuals were where I am now at some point in their life. Now I want to get to where they are. Right. And I'll tell you that it's not even just the, all the successes. It's sometimes the failures to say, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, that's what they're doing to sabotage too. And they shouldn't do that. And then there's usually a day or two later, they kind of have a little reflection going, oh, that behavior is kind of like what that other person was doing to sabotage. Do I sabotage myself? I might. It, just some of that I, I mean, it's called mirror neurons where you see a behavior and then you can reflect to see, can I do that behavior? And you used a lot of those when growing up. So what your parents do, you do. Um, but it, there are other ways to learn it. Uh, right. Where if your parents didn't do that, if they always drank, drank when they were happy and drank when they were sad and drank when they were, for whatever reason, and now you're trying to figure out a way to not do that. You actually have to see somebody living that way in order to, for your brain to really want to grab on that, especially in a time of emotion. Right. And it works way better than my prescriptions. Shoot. We get a lot of practitioners, especially in meetings that I talk with, that they have an interest in using our test kits, but also they want to grow their brand and they want a private label. You've decided to do that and had a lot of success. Can you talk about that private label process? Number one, why you decided to do that and, and brand your own test kits? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that was a um, uh, a time where I was still trying to get, um, you know, like I said, from the very first video, if you had to pull the people who watch me on social media, come to my clinic, uh, and you say, why do you choose that? They'll, they'll usually say something like, well, I like the way she teaches, or I trust her. And when you look at a lot of people on social media or even in clinics where you go to the doctor's clinic and they have a whole bunch of things for sale and they are the same things that the next door neighbor is selling but everybody else has a different label on them you say well why do they do that and it's because the people walking in the door trust the doctor and they want to they want to believe what, what the doctor's peddling is <laughs> going to help them and i use a little bit of disparaging uh words there because i mean i've seen that abused i've seen that like every multivitamin under the sun is going to make you better. And then when it's got the doctor's label on it, but there is some value to that where when you get a test, like, like Omega quant where, oh my gosh, it's got literature, it's got research. They, it is, it isn't, well, Dr. Bill Harris is still not touting his, his value as well as I think he should. Uh, so, so when I put my label on that, it was because the value of what this test was showing, I wanted, I wanted to leverage the trust to say, this is the test we should be following every three months, not your total cholesterol. And, you know, this is the test that you should be looking at, not just, you know, did I, you know, do I, do I, do I feel badly? You know, so, you know, some of the subjective symptoms. And so when I put went to put on that label on the the you know I think the first one I did was uh, the vitamin D and then I did the um, the uh, A1C. Both of them were in a place where I said, "Yep, it, it is." 
something I don't have to explain when they see my label and they know that there's evidence-based medicine behind it. There's evidence about how you improve this. And so I think that part of it was I was tired of saying, no, 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 this one's for real. And when, it, when I put my label on it, what I was really showing them was I don't put my name on just anything. It really has to be either something I'm using or I'm uh, or my someone in my immediate family is. Uh, I think the other other really thing that was important to me was I I think there should be more of this. I think there should be more companies that do this and that the future of medicine has point of care. But the only way we get to see a better future is to really support companies that that have the innovation and not just you know a whimsical, but really your company has evidence and it is proven and all the work was done before I got there. And you're like, oh, that is the nicest reward. And to say, I want to support companies that do that is, you know, period. That's, I want more of you. And we have a lot more research coming out in the near future and things we're doing on the research side of things that we don't talk a lot about. So we're excited as those things continue to progress, we're gonna share more about some grants and things in specialty areas that I think you're gonna love. Now, you mentioned about the healthcare, you know, you really focus on that preventative healthcare model, which I think in, in most, it's a sick care model. Like you said, go to the doctor, they're there for 10, 20 minutes. Here's your drug. See you next time. Let's look at that data. I'm glad you're, you know, you're looking at other ways to do that. With the success you've had in, you know, your practice, especially with those test kits, at how do you market your testing program to your customers? Is it through your YouTube? Is it through website? Is it through your practice? What are some tips for practitioners that you would recommend for them that are considering this or that are doing it now that, that they want to grow it? Yeah, I also found that when um, the other reason I did a white label on there was when I did want my patients to do it, that um, one stop for them to, you know, find me, get to the appointments. Uh, you can't hardly have a business today in medicine without, after COVID at least, without a website, that your website links them to the places where here's what you can do without me. And even if you're never my patient, you can still do this without me. So I think, you know, that accessibility, that was a benefit of white label is I could control the volume and how, you know, it's just, it was much more in the flow of how to, to do that. I know that the, um, there, the, the Omega-3, uh, I, I started using that and set up that process before the test. I mean, the other two, as the test came out, I white labeled them right away. Um, so I've never gone back and white labeled the Omega-3, which I probably should, but just haven't. Um, and I look at the difference between how um, the ones that I white label, the patients just, they, they're a higher user of. Um, when it's the omega-3, the one that I think is the most valuable, I think that they don't have as much retention to following through uh, as what I would wish. Uh, and when I compare it to the people who check their vitamin D until their vitamin D is normal, their A1C until their A1C is normal. I mean, I can get them to do that almost every month until they're normal. When it was the omega-3, I, I think there is a, a drop-off of their um, commitment when it wasn't involving my practice. Um, so, so there's that. The other thing that I we spoke about earlier that I think should be reiterated is I show them that that's how I test me. That <laughs> I don't want to go to another doctor and find a doctor to check my vitamin D and argue with them that, yes, I know it was 41, but I want it to be 50. And here's why I want it to be. And, I don't, and so... I don't want to fight with them. I don't want to fight with an insurance company. I just want to get the best health care for me. And here's what I believe. And here's, I, here's how I stand. So when patients would see me checking myself, it was a game changer. Like, oh, that's what she does. And so that example became more powerful, I think. Excellent. We just have a few more questions for Dr. Boss. So if you have a question for her before we end, please type that in the chat. We'll get to answer that just shortly. Just a couple more questions, Dr. Boss. With omega-3 being such a versatile nutrient, having a lot of different benefits, do you feel more practitioners should include this as a biomarker as part of their routine exam? Vitamin D, you said? Omega-3. Omega-3. I was like, wow, I'm sorry, I misheard you. Honestly, that, again, like, I said, that's my first thing of saying, you know, you're looking at longevity. You're looking at how do you get away from me? How do you get away from me? This is this. And I, I you know, your company did a really great um, move in the last year. And the day I saw this, I sent a text to uh, Bill Harris, which was um, uh, find, uh, find my fitness. Um, 
Oh, give me a help. Who's the leader of Follow My Fitness? Um, I'm familiar with her. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's she, she now uh, it works with Bill Harris in his uh, research. Oh, Rhonda oh, Patrick. Rhonda Patrick. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. Rhonda Patrick. Yeah. So I mean, a voice in the space of medicine, where when you look at um, how do you get the best health out of you, uh, you know, she's been in that same lane of really good research behind what she's saying, uses social media, tries to say that the most valuable thing we can offer you uh, isn't that I write you a prescription, but it's that I show you how to improve this. And you know, like the day that you brought her on board or that month when I saw that, I'm like, that is perfect. That's the kind of awareness that um, omega-3 measurements need is some, you know, a voice like, like, like Rhonda Patrick. And, you know, she tested in herself. She, you know, speaks openly about her risk for, you know, Alzheimer's and knowing that. And, and she's incredibly healthy, but she doesn't skip checking her omega-3. That accountability, that prevention, the, the literature is too vast and too deep. When I look at some of the other things that are easier to get people to, to begin checking, which is like vitamin D and that A1C, I think those are sexy and they're easy to get people to say, yeah, you should have this better and we can do the little competitions. But if I had to pull away and say, what is the one, if I only got one test to look at in my own health, the omega-3 is where I would be putting my energy uh, to say, you got to have this higher. And not to say that the other ones don't matter, but I think there's just such an unspoken amount of education that is out there, but it's written in lovely papers that only goofy people like to read. And um, I'm one of those goofy people. So I find that, you know, what Rhonda Patrick does, what I try to do is translate that into a, a story, into a place that says, here's how you prevent that elder Parkinson person that showed up in the first years of my practice saying, really, there's not a lot I can do. We had to start this 20 years ago. And what is that that we needed to start 20 years ago? Oh, you need to have flexible cell membranes, which is what omega-3 <coughs> will help you know, improve in one of the highest returns for supplements, period. So with, with like over 90% or 80% of people low or deficient in omega-3, do you get some skeptics that come in and say, well, I already take fish oil, Dr. Boz. Why do I need to test myself? Is that something you ever get any of those? Yeah, I, I point to the same kind of crap that hen, ends up in the vitamin D literature. Now, all these studies say vitamin D doesn't help. We put a bunch of people on it and they didn't get better. I'm like, yeah, but in every vitamin D study, for some knuckleheaded reason, they didn't test at the beginning and treat to a number. When you do that, you get this unbelievable separation of health. Same thing with omega quant or um, uh, omega-3. When, when you look at people taking fish oil, that's just this behavior that should never be done blindly. You should be measuring, did you hit the mark? Otherwise, you are wasting the energy. I, I, I call it wasting the pain, the pain of buying the pill and keeping it on and taking it every day and being compliant. Okay, do all that, but do it in a way that you measure, just like you would step on a scale or check your blood pressure. Don't take fish oil without checking, did it get into the cell membranes, which is where it matters, especially in the brain. And right. omega-3 is, uh, omega quants uh, uh, testing is the only one that I I know of. If, if another way measures it, it isn't nearly as accessible or reproducible or have as much research behind it as yours does. Last couple of questions. <laughs> what advice would you give to practitioners that are maybe on the cusp or considering adding finger stick to their uh, practice? Yeah. Honestly, I would just test your family. Uh, I think that's a beginning step to, um, so I, I can remember the first time I really dove in and really tried to teach why vitamin D was so important. And I came across the literature of teenage brains and I was at the time raising three teenage boys. And uh, so I said, all right, we're gonna do a test for everybody. Uh, and we brought home all the, I you know, got five, uh, uh, vitamin D test, test mom, dad, and all three kids. And, uh, and I was so sure I was going to win. <laughs> and dang it, if I lost, I was number five out of five. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, oh, that's the point. Yeah, I think I do a good job. But really measuring it changed. Like, I'm pretty healthy but I know I'm going to be better health if I've got my vitamin. So that, I think that process of when you think it's not important, just play the experiment on you. 
uh, test everybody in your family saying, you know what, the, the, you know, Valentine's Day gifts is everybody prick your finger. And that sounds a little goofy, but it's a fun experiment for the family to say, no, this is why I care. People like competition. So that that is kind of fun. Anything else in today's conversation that you'd like to share with those that are attending live or are going to be watching the replay? No, I, I really want to say that I, praises for your team and how committed they've been to, you know, really proving what they do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that that process of trying to to change my practice, which I didn't plan on changing, it kind of changed in front of me and I was either going to adapt or not have patience, was if we are really trying to reach for tomorrow's health, uh, the old way that we've been doing things is it's not going to win. Uh, brokering every one of our decisions by another ivory tower filled with shiny shoes that says, here's when you can do that test. I think it gets further away from the people who who care enough about others to have gone to practitioner school of whatever ones they do. And, and that transmission of collecting real, I mean, hard data that then can transform behavior in a patient. Uh, I, I love getting the brokers out of the way and saying, look, there are very few companies that have the kind of power and science behind what they're doing. Uh, there needs to be a whole bunch more of Omega quants out there. We appreciate everything that you've done, your partnership, the work that you continue to do in preventative medicine. We do have a question that's come in. So if you have a question for Dr. Boz, I know we're getting to the top of the hour of nearly one central. Um, please put that in the chat. We'll get that answered as quick as possible. One of the questions that, have, that has come through is, which of the types of omega tests do you recommend? I, I know we have three, the basic, the plus, and the, the complete. What's the benefit of ordering maybe something that's higher than the basic, if you want to maybe add that? Yeah, so when they do the complete, I do think it just, it's the printout and how it explains it to the patient that I think does a pretty good job. So I always start with a complete, but I usually follow up with the, what's the middle one called? The plus. The plus, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it it is what I, actually, I was one of the questions that I asked Bill Harris about was what, you know, where do you go after you really understand where your baseline is? And you know that's a it's a chunk of change as you go up on the the numbers that you really get everything you're going to need from uh, the basic. But I find that the plus is explained in a well that the patients understand it better when they look at that ratio and they look at how it compares to one another. And um, you know the good part is is on the dashboard they can still follow the numbers that matter the most. So whichever one they're doing, it just still adds to that dashboard. Excellent. Another great question. Once you do the omega test, how do you know what to supplement? I guess they're asking how much to give based on someone's score. Yeah, there's a couple of calculators on the on the test for um, the for omega quants dashboard, and I've sent patients to those too. Um, you know, I think what I've learned. So let's start with omega quant uh, and or omega three. When you look at the different ways that you can supplement omega-3 and even the prescription that you can write for that. Um, boy, I have found that um, the research you guys have put behind using that um, triglyceride form of uh, omega-3, it just made the world a difference. It was people taking supplements having hardly any movement in their numbers versus people taking supplements and being the true knuckleheaded patients that we all are, which is not compliant perfectly, especially when I'm asking you to take it every day, but boy, oh boy, their numbers went up. And so I think um, yeah, when, when, I, when people ask for replacement, I can write it, but what I've learned is if I'm replacing it in somebody who's highly insulin you know, soaked, meaning they've been insulin resistant for a while, they're 50 pounds overweight, their blood pressure's high, and I'm trying to increase their omega-3, sure, that's important, but that dosing is going to be a far greater um, challenge uh, because of their GI lining and their absorption. And because once that fat does get in circulation, that insulin just puts it out of circulation so darn quick. The same thing that happens with a vitamin D. It's a fat-soluble molecule that gets put out of circulation. So it's where even on YouTube, when I'm trying to not give medical advice, but say, how do I think about it? I say the same thing I do behind an exam room door, which is 
you will teach me how well your body is uh, responding to our treatment. And it's in those cases where I say, I know it's supposed to wait three months to check this up, but I need you to check it at one month and two months because I need to know that the dose we're giving you is making a movement of that. And you can't afford to wait um, till the, you know, you know, three months and then turns into four months. And now we're, to, you know, two to three times a year instead of, I need the right dose in you within the next eight weeks. And if I get two checks of your numbers in the next month, even though that's against recommend, you know, guidelines for the FDA, um, point of care, you can test as much as you want as long as the resources are available to you, meaning the, the money. Last question, because I know we're getting, you know, close and I want to be respective of your time. Um, do you have a formula of EPA DHA ratios that you use when you supplement? Not really the brand, but just like, do you recommend a certain amount of milligrams based on someone's score? Or uh, is it more so, equal parts? Um, yeah, I, I always like the omega-3 to be higher than the omega-6 when I'm do, doing the ratios. Or, or no, EPA versus DHA. So the EPA to be higher than the DHA. You know what? I, I Where I learned this the best, though, was um, that I, I don't know if the learning curve was happening in Christine, one of your, your science leaders, Dr. Harris or Dr. Harris, at the same time I was learning. But about the time you guys came out with the products that you put on there, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what my research said. So um, I, I suppose on your website, they can, is it a separate website or the same website to find that information? In, for the calculator or the actual omega-3? Yeah, the omega-3 that you guys sell. Yeah, it's it's actually on our, it's on this omegaquant.com. Yeah, there um, you go. But the calculator I put in the chat, so that way it can help kind of people understand based on omega-3 type, as you mentioned, ethyl ester is the most common, that's processed oil, that's gonna still drive your numbers up, but you have to take that with food and you have to take a lot more because of the poor bioavailability. There are other forms, triglyceride, the phospholipid, the krill, there's monoglyceride, there's others that can be equally effective, but that all the data can be shared. Um, Dr. Yeah. Boz, just incredible information. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, what, what after I got done reading it, I looked at the, I looked at their your your options and said, oh, this is just much easier to do what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, and if anyone wants those studies, I'm going to put in my my email address. That way, you can email me. It's also on our website. There's access to a lot of our research that we do, as well as others. Um, please email me here, Dr. Boz. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. What a great way to kick off 2024 with just a different format when it comes to our education. I'm sure our practitioners and those watching loved watching the information that you share today. Well, you made it pretty easy. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Don't forget, uh, February the 20th, Dr. Bill Harris, our founder of Omega Quan, is going to be talking about Omega-3 and AFib. What's the real story? So we're going to be promoting that. You'll be getting a link soon. I will also be sending out a copy of the replay of this. So if you were not able to stay for the whole thing, or if you're watching for the first time, um, then you'll have a chance to, to review this and catch some things that you may have missed. Um, again, thank you all so much, Dr. Vaz. We really appreciate your time. We know you're busy. Really, thank you for being a great partner, but also sharing your wisdom with our group today. Say hi to the troops in South Dakota. Will do. Y'all take care. Y'all have a great time. We'll see you in February. Everyone have a great day.